Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Hello, close your cause, right? That's for, for the new bankers over there. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, joining me today on this presentation where I'll be talking about how, uh, from my perspective on my journey on learning closure, how uh, engineering principles help us to architect the systems. Right, so on this presentation, uh, I'd like to take this journey of starting from code organization principles, thinking on uh, engineering practices, right, how we work as a team into how we can think about what guides our decision making behind, regardless of the change we are doing, uh, how we done that at New Bank. Uh, and for that, I'll, I'll be telling you and sharing a little bit of my personal history by learning closure. So who am I? I'm Bruno Tavares, uh, I'm a Brazilian, uh, working at New Bank for the last six, about six years. And previously I was a hobbyist working at closure. With closure, like since 2013, I was trying to learn it uh, to appreciate a little bit more functional programming. Uh, and at that journey, I started to get a little bit on small projects. So let's get to the start. Um, when I was working in a hobbyist manner on small projects on teams at a consultancy company, it, it was a little bit challenging to see how closure would work on a different environment, right? So you have to try to sell that to your customer, right? Like your client that you're trying to work on a Java 4 environment, and that's not very easy. So uh, I'll, I'll the code that I would write in Clojure was a little bit relegated to toy project, right? Like how would that functional programming work? Those were questions that I start to ask myself. Uh, does it scale? How's the code organization with working with people on all other teams, right? Uh, how does it work with immutable data? Because are, are you generating a lot of memory? What, what does that mean? Right? And some of these questions are questions that I don't think you can answer on toy projects. Right? Like it, it requires uh, some time working on large scale over a period of time to be able to understand and fully appreciate what Clojure has to offer you. And it was on that point in 2017 uh, that I joined a new bank to write Clojure professionally. Right? Uh, at the time, New Bank was uh, very exciting. I was a customer since 2014, 2015, 15, and at this moment, I had the chance to work on something that I was actually using. I was one of the customers on and using functional programming with other people. And that, to me, was uh, really interesting, using microservices, actually being on an environment where you can write tasks and people really understand it and really look forward on having good code, right? Uh, just to paint a picture here, when I joined a new bank, we had one financial service, right? We were still operating with the credit card. We had one country, right? And we were celebrating our first million customer. And pay attention, first million, that, that's exciting, right? For me, it was like, First million customer, that, that, that's a lot of customers. Uh, if I change this code, that has a lot of impact. And at that moment, I read it felt like a big thing. And I started trying to understand how to learn to write idiomatic closure. It's not something that you, you arrive and you know how to do it. Right? Like you're so used to uh, writing object-oriented uh, object -oriented code. And it, it's quite challenging to wrap your head around um, functional programming, right? Like you start to get acquainted and my colleagues, I had a chance that with them, they would provide me the feedback that I needed on how to write code. So let's take a, a deeper look on, on what it means to, to write idiomatic closure on my perspective. So I would read a lot of code but when I would write, there was something off, right? Um, why would that not feel idiomatic? Can anybody tell why it would not feel idiomatic? 
It's a function that takes a key, a model, and a predicate, but it somehow didn't fit the rest of the code base. And it was not clear for me why. And in the end, it was a very simple reason. The order of the arguments was off. So I would start receiving those feedbacks, and people would tell me, functions with model take the model first. Right? That's a very simple phrase that was a feedback from one of my colleagues on, on one of those idioms. And you can see that on the SOC, which I learned today because I'm the team, the SOC. Right? <laughs> Everything that operates in closure on the standard library that takes a model, takes the model first. And that is to compose with each other on, for example, on the thread macro first. If you do it, it fits in nicely, right? Another example I'll take here is functions with collections take collections last. And those are deliberate decisions on how you organize your code. So there's a code organization principles that are applied within the code standard library and unintentionally we start copying, or, or at least I started copying that on the logic that I would write without really understanding it, but those were feedbacks, like people could r tell me this phrase and I would understand that I have to adjust my code. So if I change the order of the arguments, now my code feels idiomatic because then I can compose with the rest of the system, right? Everything else will start to fit. I don't need to do, use more let bindings to move arguments around because now the code comes back to some of the principles of closure, which is simplicity, right? It's concise code and it starts to fit within that system. So that was one of the uh, practices that I started adopting. And when we talk about onboarding a new bank, those are some of the practices that we have on this code organization principle, right? So still looking at this, a lower principle on code, and that will be replicated on other parts as I go on the presentation. So large arguments first, then smaller arguments. So you take like larger system maps, then smaller units, and, and like in the end, you take like digits and, and numbers, right? Using uh, exclamation point to represent side effect. Uh, we already had a, a talk on, on this stage, I guess, about hexagonal architecture. So we had those encoded and explicit for newcomers such as I was at the time. And that helped me to understand how I could write code that fits into these idioms. So, so how I would represent, I'm talking about the idiomatic code all the time. So I would say that the idiomatic code, it's a code, it's code that fits into the norms of a certain group, right? If you start moving away from these norms and this principle, it will feel strange, right? It will not fit into the rest of the system and, it, and the reasoning about it starts to become uh, attrition, right? Like it, it, you have a friction to understand that code because it doesn't fit the normal of those groups. So the lesson that I learned by looking at code organization principles is that it's very useful to define them clearly so other people can learn about it as well, right? So when I was joining, those feedback really helped me. And being able to name and discuss it was something that helped me to feel part of that group. And I was learning that, like I, I had a lot of pairing sessions, right? So we would be in the office, we, we would be a small squad, we would be all together, but that kind of doesn't scale, right? Like passing that knowledge forward only through pairing sessions, only through uh, saying it doesn't scale because you would have to repeat that a lot of times. And I don't know about you, but I kind of get tired of talking, not right now, but I, I do get tired of talking at some point. And we started growing a lot, right? So Newbank, uh, 
I'll, I'll compress this in 2018 forward. Um, we, we had a lot of people to get on board. I had a lot of people that was onboarding as well after I got a little bit more acquainted with our code base. And we think that we have to understand that not everyone's a closureist yet, <laughs> right? It's not as easy to find people that had previous experience with closure, but regardless, we grew. There was something magical on, on, on defining those principles on a code organization level that will help a lot of people become the closures that they are now today, right? And a lot of people didn't know about closure until they joined the new bank. And they learned it there, working with closure and getting those feedbacks similar to how I did. And so let's talk about some practices, moving a little bit on a new level of principles, right? So not only we start talking about cold organization principles, but we start uh, talking about also idiomatic practices. How you write tests, how you organize your code, how you ship it to production, what do you expect from your system? And if the norms are clear for everyone, right, if you have it clearly defined, the set of expectations of I expect tests to be part of your job, people will understand, we'll be able to discuss it, and we'll be able to learn. So here are a few of the practices that I would consider idiomatic at New Bank. Uh, we had a really solid foundation from the, the get-go, and when I joined it, a couple of them already existed. Others, I was able to help it grow and nurture it. But from the start, uh, we have microservice architecture, right? loosely coupled components that allow for parallel and rapid, rapid growth of, uh, of systems. We had adopted continuous delivery from the beginning, uh, hexagonal architecture once again, right? And many other philosophies since you build, you run. So that's part of how you get feedback from your customer. So that feeling of a multifunctional team working together. And these are some of these building on top of cold organization principles, some practices principles, right? So how do we start organizing the code by working together? And then we start making architecture decisions, looking at a bigger scale from those practices we adopted to uh, looking at how architectures are done, right? Systems, how the systems behave and what do we expect those systems to do for example, what's the failure mode of a system? What's the, the process of updating the system? What's the process of, uh, what would you expect on these situations? And from architectural decisions, uh, we surfaces these patterns and these systems idioms that will help you create more of the systems that will fit together. So um, one of the examples I'll bring to here is our data set expectation. Uh, we already had Gadi early today mentioning that our data set is calculated daily, and this was like one of our first decisions on how we do systems. So every data set is recalculated from knowledge to ensure consistency. That, that's a norm, right? That's an expectation that we have. That's a principle on the system that we use that if we'd say that for an engineer on the team, like just recalculate the data set, they would understand it. Like it, it conveys a message with it. And that decision has the reason to, whenever you update any logic, you will recalculate it without having the issue of um, disturbance on miscalculation. So if you miscalculate something, in the day two of your business, and you keep calculating on top of it, that will have drastic consequences. So we didn't want to do it, and that's why I defined this expectation for everyone to know that data sets will do this. So we can see an example here. Um, whenever we start the system, that's day one, day two, and day three, and generate a report, if I update any logic, and it would fix something on day two, that day two will 
ensure that they treat and now that day four is correct for any reports that I generate. Right, so there is this expectation. Um, another example of another expectation we had and we decided we would just say we publish it. What does that mean? For us, republishing means that every system has to be able to republish information and pass it forward without causing side effects if it's already been done. So it could, from initial entry point of information, stimulate it again on my system, and everything else would pass it forward. It will ensure that whatever it has to do, it will do it. It will not generate any side effects because, again, we are a financial institution. Uh, we don't want uh, to double the money of anyone by uh, test. <laughs> Maybe the customers do want that, but like we don't, or the customers don't want to lose money twice, right? So that, that, that's double-edged in the sense. But we had that expectation. So every system that behaved like this would fit into our expectation. And that would be one of our architectural principles on how we organize our code. And if a system didn't fit into it, that's where problems start to happen. On that friction point of this system is not republishable. Everything else is, but this is not. And now it, we have issues here because we were expecting this idiom and we were thinking on that mindset, on that expectation, on that norms of this group, but because this was different, we would not be able to think <coughs> similarly on that model. So one example here is backfilling information. So if I create a new service and this service does not have old data, what I can do is go from the beginning of the flow and generate that stimulus again and now it will backfill the information for any new services. Because I know that if I do that on the first service that received that event, it will pass it forward. And when it passes forward, these new systems would have the backfilled information. Right? So this is one of, of our architecture idioms. Right? So there is this idiomatic architecture that comes from these code practices from these uh, development practices from these architectural practices. And the lesson that I learned here is once again, being able to name these architectural principles helps us to discuss it as a group. So if I can name those expectations and define it for new people, we can discuss and sometimes we might change those expectations because we learn something new, but that's part of the discussion. So until we define it, that be, continues being a gut feeling, right? So you look at it like, that's not right, and why so? Why, why it doesn't feel right? As the example I had on the code, I, I couldn't tell why until someone explained it to me, the code organization principle. So, I would like to present some of these ideas of how we can scale this architecture, right? As I mentioned, when I joined it, we were um, a smaller company. It's still very large for me. It's still something that I was like amazed at, but we grew, right? We had uh, a lot of new services added on, and throughout this decision-making process of scaling, a lot of the premises of what we had changed. Right. Our systems were created with a certain point in time, and that requirement changed. Does it change how we build stuff? It can certainly change what we have, but not how we build. And that starts to, well, let me paint a picture for you to grow quite fast. So we went from one product to 10 and more nowadays. We have now three countries, right? We have more than 50 million customers in 2022. That's much more now, right? And we continue growing. So a lot of the decisions that we made on our system principles 
There was a reason behind it, and it continues to happen, but the concrete system has to change, and that's normal. Right? That's natural. You start to learn new things, things that were not so important in the past now become important, or things that were really important in the past now become less important, but there was something behind it. Right? There's, there, there is a principle on how to think about the change itself. And to me, that comes to being our engineering principles. It doesn't matter the result or, or, or the outcome itself of the code, but there is a way to think that is expected for everyone from code organization to coding practices to systems practices to architecture patterns and to how we approach change. So engineering principles at New Bank was a process that we tried to encode all this information from the beginning because we are already talking about now thousands of engineers working together um, and trying to explain and define as part of this lessons learned of if we define, we can discuss. So we went through this process of collecting a couple of these informations and, and these gut feelings from everyone and try to concisely express it so we as a group can discuss it. And I'd like to present you our engineering principles, right? So uh, at New Bank, when we start thinking about how we build stuff, and how we think about creating systems and architectures and, and code organization, it's throughout, right? It applies to every day, it applies to organization, it applies to how we would like to see our systems behave. And that would be like leveraging through platforms so we can continue growing, right? Uh, customer trust is hard to earn and it is to lose. We are a financial company. It's really important that we don't lose trust. Um, data as strategic asset, right? How we look at our data sets, for example, that is, is strategic to our business. Um, ownership and technical resilience, we don't want to crash. And if you crash, we're going to fix it, right? That's what, what it means in the end. It's you build, you run, right? It's yours. And canonical approach is consistently applied which is we'll make sure that we can experiment, but there is a really big benefit of having consistency. Um, everyone here writes Clojure. Everyone knows that Clojure has a very consistent syntax. Who appreciates the Clojure's consistent syntax? That's really good, right? We also appreciate it. And when we start thinking about how we do it, we do it on code organization, if you look in the service code, the shape of it, even if it differs a little bit, the shape of it, it's very similar everywhere. And that provides us very interesting properties that I'll present a little bit later. I'll give you some examples. But lesson learned here on approaching this exercise is once again, defining, explicit defining your engineering principles that you discuss it as a group. Right? Maybe yours is not the same as ours, and that's fine. But the important here is that my lesson taken is doing that exercise and sharing that within the company help us to create more resilient systems, teams, and everything that we do. So I'd like to take a step back and revisit a summary of all these principles from the code and architecture and uh, the engineering principles in cell on how we do stuff. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to summarize it very quickly. Um, lucid couple, architecture, persistent, data models, event-driven design. Um, does it feel closure to you somehow? I'll, I'll, I know it's a little bit of a, maybe a stretch here, uh, but let me give an example of how I see it, right? So closure code with protocols, right? So it's loosely coupled. Uh, we use persistent data models. Closure has persistent data structures. Even driven design, even driven mutability through atoms, right? So you're always doing uh, compare and update. And consistent syntax, right? In the same way that we have consistent code design. 
I know it's a bit of a stretch, but uh, that, that's <laughs> for me to help to prove my point. Uh, <laughs> um, and the question that comes to my mind is, did our engineering principles guide our use of closure, or did closure shape how we think? Right, and that can get very philosophical. I will try not to do it. But it's a very interesting to me, uh, I'm really fond of this uh, linguistic theory, right, hypothesis that says that uh, the language you use limits how you think, and the way you think limits your language use. So there's a big, deep relationship here uh, that I'll throw a, a challenge for everyone here. Try to think of a new color. Difficult, right? Maybe you can use compound words to do it and explain it to me and try to convey it, but a really new color, it's a concept, right? You have a name for it. And there are languages that have more names to colors than ours, and they can express that, and they can think about those colors in that sense, and they can express it, right? So when you start thinking about how our language model our thoughts, that model our language that model our thoughts, it's really hard to say what started first, right? So there is a feedback loop that happens on what you look for in a language as well, what your engineering principles and your values, to what the tool that you use values the most. And there is a special thing that happens when those two align that you start having a really good environment. So I'll try to answer this question. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's all I can say, right? Because as I mentioned, um, we can start thinking about it from principles first, from the, going from the engineering principles we define to how we do architectures and systems to how we do code organization. We can go top to bottom, but I started a presentation bottom to top, right? So there is a way of going about it that you reason it from first principles or you can learn about it and realize it's applied all the way down, right? So it's cyclical in a sense that whenever everything is happening, it's happening at the same time. You're thinking, and when there's this high cohesion, it's a really good environment for creative solutioning. So the lesson learned here for me is that by having all this laid out as written, for example, a way I could look at it, it helped me to gather further insight, right? So it helped me to discuss it with myself. What do I expect from the tools that I use? Um, did, did I join Newbank because the th things that I was looking for were the values that it already had, or did I help it build the values that I would like to see, right? And, and it can get very philosophical, but um, I would like to take a step back. Right, I, I can't answer that for you. Um, but I think that this is truly the magical place that everyone would like to be, right? When uh, we have this environment where um, your values and your group values and your two values are all connected together. And within that place, uh, you can start proposing very interesting solutions that maybe the outcomes could happen in other languages or in other tools, like the outcome could be similar, it could be even the same outcome, but the way it's done, it will not be, right? Because the way it's done, it's less friction because it's aligned on how you think and on how your group thinks and what your group expects. So I'd like to propose some examples here and uh, expose some of these examples uh, where we have um, some use of new bank and closure that are so interconnected, so intertwined, that I find it hard to know what started first, right? And when we have it in practice, it, at least for me, I, I could go over several examples, but these are some of the examples that I, I brought in today for the time being. So one of our systems that we've built internally, it's called Sashin which is an alliteration of schema and our contract validation tool. 
So to make sure that schemas are not session, right, we use session, right? Uh, and that was a point in time where we already had, we used a lot of testing. Uh, we had a very large set of integration tests and that was impacting how we wanted to deliver software. We want to deliver it fast. And that was going against our expectations, our norms, our principle of fast delivery of software. So we look at how we could do it. And we even use Swagger in the past, right? You can write it with JSON API. You can do annotations in Java to define those expectations. There are a lot of ways of approaching contract tests. Right, there's spec, there's so many tools available in the market, but the way that we build, we look at back on, well, we already use a lot of schema, right? That could be done similarly with spec, right? But we already had a lot of use of schema in our code base. Uh, we use that for generative tests. We would use that for fuzzing inputs. We would use that for ensuring that during unit tests, the mock values we had were valid mocks. Could we leverage it somehow? Right? This information was already available. And what Clojure gives us is these data validation models as data structures. The same way that Clojure code is also a data structure. So if I can take this code, and which is this definition of a schema, which takes a value of type string, Right, so it's a format string, and I put in a file. I can reason about it as code. I could put that in a database. I could start evaluating that in another system. You can start composing and building on top of it. So in the end of the day, what we did was look at what we already had and started building the systems where uh, we could define everything that we already use on one service and put it together in this catalog. And within this catalog, whenever a change was made, we could validate then against all these other expectations. So it reduced a lot our time to ship because now 80%, I'll say 80% of Pareto here, 80% uh, of our time would be covered by contract testing. It could reduce a lot of our time waiting by creating 80% of the issues we would find on integration tests. Um, and another way that I think it's unique to how we use Clojure, it's a recent project that I've worked on. Uh, we call it internally BDC, which is uh, meaning for a backend driven UI. And one of the challenges being on this expectation of we expect fast software delivery, fast change to the market. That's part of our principles on how we do stuff. But when you're working in the mobile environment, there is a threshold that you cannot escape, which is the App Store review, right? You can go as fast as you want until you have to get that external approval, right? And we ship internally a lot of versions. Like we are one of the, I'll, I'll risk saying that, but uh, we are certainly one of the top uh, users of the APIs of the store because they frequently fail on us. So uh, <laughs> we use that a lot to internal versions all the time. So we wanted to think how can we use what we already have and integrate it better with our tools. So uh, we wrote this server-driven UI a concept that's not new Right, like Uber uses it, Airbnb uses it, there's a lot of other companies using it. But what, what does make BDC, the way that we do, unique for me? Uh, so you can see we have this expression here, uh, which looks very similar to closure. Right, so we have this power of macros available for us that allow us to uh, build on top of our Flutter engine that we also wrote. Uh, to integrate with our tooling, right? So if you're writing code, you can define those expressions. Those expressions have some nice properties of being able to calculate, 
for example, which is the minimum available version that you have to require based on the expressions you use. Because not every app has the same widgets. Right? You ship it, you add new widgets available, and we can calculate from the expression and pre-compute that as one of our requirements for the screen. So we never let the users see broken screens. So BDC is a fully integrated experience. We look at the REPL as inspiration on how can I write uh, the same experience and pass it forward on a new environment. Right, so did, did you think, like did the wrap on spirals or was it something that we already were looking by Flutter Auto Reload and, and it's, the thing is, within this environment, when everything's clear and defined and these expectations are set, we can start doing some cool stuff. So here I have a REPL uh, open on my editor on the left side uh, and you can see that uh, we are writing and evaluating and, and doing that iteration very quickly uh, on top of our system. And not only that, I already mentioned the consistency usage of, our, of the language and the consistent syntax of closure, but our code organization allows us to go even further than that because every service has the same shape. Every part of the language, it's very consistent. So I can write automation on top of it. I can use this command that I give you a service name and it will automatically install the SDK and the necessary endpoints by modifying the underlying code of the service and open up a request for you. We can only do that because there is consistency. It's consistent applied for every service that we use. It's consistent applied on the tools that we choose, right? And the thing is, when we have this resonate, uh, resonating environment where everything is clearly aligned on both in your personal alignment, but your group and the tools, I think that's, that's a magic point that we would like to be. And as an exercise, um, you can try it yourself. Right? I think that you can start doing that by going uh, either uh, bottom up or up down. Uh, bottom up or, you got folks. <laughs> uh, and start going on what are the principles of how I organize my code. Right? What are the practices that I, I would like to attend and what, how do I think about change and try to encode that concretely so you can discuss. Right? That's important because you can realize that it changes over time. You can learn new stuff and change and that's fine as long as it's clearly defined for everyone. And you can leverage aspects of your systems that fit together on those principles. And whenever you find friction points, it's an invitation to rethink either on your, your expectations and rethink and learn something new or find a different way to do it that aligns better to what you expect your system to do. And as I mentioned, your principles may differ. Um, those are what we came up, those are the things that we highlighted from our use of Clojure. And we can say that uh, how we use Clojure, it's the new bank way of using Clojure. It's not everyone's way of using Clojure because everyone has different expectations. You can look at Clojure and you can highlight different aspects of it. You can highlight, uh, if you highlight, for example, its interoperability, you probably want it running on different environments. CRL, you can run it JavaScript and you can run it Dart now. So you can start looking at that's one aspect of the tool because what I want to build requires interoperability. That's what I'd like to highlight. Or lightweightness or portability, right? Like there's, there's several things that you can highlight and compose and sometimes they will overlap with what we propose. Sometimes they may differ, but for your team, it has to be consistent. Right, so I'll leave that with a question. I'll probably not answer uh, anything right now because that's, that's what I like to propose. What are your principles in your teams, in your company, on how you use your tools of the selection of the practices that you choose 
the way that you practice writing code. Uh, and I'll be here all day tomorrow as well. If you, I'll be on the chat room, I'll be available to, to chat and give you more examples. But I think that this exercise may be uh, useful regardless of your language as well. Maybe there are other things that you highlight and you would like to integrate better, right? There are several ways to approach it, um, but that has to be yours. So thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Uh, I'll be available to chat. You can scan that QR code. Uh, and we will be available to give you more examples. Uh, you can send me an email and the end of the, the, the presentation, I really would like to thank you, the community, for uh, having me here and having, uh, please, chat. And I'll, I'll be glad to share more uh, uses of how we've built systems at New Bank. So thank you. <laughs>